ta fatu a glia ta sarin e institut bara alla institut har blivit bara glia or a glia and let's uh, start tonight's program it's uh, the dark matter day uh, science and saunaga science is an annual event hosted by the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies, created by the researchers at the Institute. Uh, it is now in its fourth year, and uh, it uh, focuses on the uh, disciplines of the Institute, Celtic Studies, Theoretic Physics, and Cosmic Physics, which incorporates astronomy, astrophysics, and uh, geophysics. And the theme of the festival is around um, science and Halloween. And this year we are, and this speaker, we are focusing on exploring the dark side of the universe and our theoretical physics contribution this year is going to be given by uh, Catherine Fries. Uh, Catherine Fries received her BA in, from Princeton University. She has a very long pedigree and I'll go through some of it. I'm, Probably going to skip some of it. Uh, she went to from MA to Columbia University, received her PhD in physics from the University of Chicago, had postdocs at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, uh, post presidential fellow at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, she was a postdoc at the Institute for Theoretical Physics at Santa Barbara. She was an assistant professor at the Massachusetts. Massachusetts Institute of Technology, um, Sloan Foundation Fellow, I believe. She was George E. Uhlenbeck Professor at the University of Michigan, and she was director of Nordita, the uh, Nordic Institute for Theoretical Physics from 2014 to 2018. Uh, she is now the Jeff and Gail uh, Kadoski Endowed Chair at the University of Texas at Austin. And her, she's working to identify dark matter and dark energy that are uh, dominant in our universe. And to tell us what they are about, she's here tonight. She has written a book, well-known book, the, the Cosmic Cocktail, Three Parts, Dark Matter. She has many awards to her name. Uh, she was elected to the American Physical Society. She was awarded the Simons Foundation Fellowship. She recently won the Lillenfeld Prize from the American Physical Society. And congratulations, she was recently elected to the um, National Academy of Sciences, a very prestigious award in the United States. So it's a tremendous pleasure uh, to uh, welcome uh, Catherine Fries to present tonight's lecture. I hand over to you, Catherine. Thank you. Andrew, thank you so much for this lovely introduction. And now let me begin sharing my screen. So can everybody see the screen? Yes. Look, okay, great. So I want to to start off with this picture of myself actually at Nordita in I borrowed an umbrella from an astronomy professor and you can see in here all the constellations. Well, that is the matter that gives off light that you see in the universe. This is exactly the stuff I'm not talking about because I'm talking about not the light matter, but the dark matter in the universe. So I was saying that every, that, that every um, since antiquity, there were creation myths for every culture. And we have our own creation story, the hot big bang. But the difference is that it's just amazing that ours is correct. So the hot big bang is, um, we've, we've got so much, so many observations showing that the basic idea is, is right. It's incomplete, but it's basically correct. And so all of this modern cosmology began with Einstein's relativity in 1915. And soon after others applied the theory of relativity to the universe as a whole, and wrote down the equations describing the evolution of the universe. There were several possible solutions to the equations. The universe could be expanding, contracting, or static. Now, Einstein preferred the idea of a static universe, which would have the symmetry that it would look the same at all times. 
But soon after the work of Edwin Hubble in 1929 showed us, well, he made major advances and he was using the telescopes in California, the Mount Wilson, in Mount Wilson Observatory. The first thing he did was proof that other galaxies exist beyond our own. Before that, people had looked into the night sky and thought all those stars might be inside the Milky Way. But he proved that things are just so far away that there must be other galaxies. The second thing that he did was observe light from these galaxies at various distances from the Earth. And he knew the wavelength of the light at the time it's emitted because there are certain atoms in these galaxies. So we know the length of the waves coming out of those atoms. And by the time he observed them, these waves were stretched. And so the conclusion is that between emission and today, the universe was, was expanding. And you can see an, a, a mock-up of this in this balloon. When you blow up a, a balloon and you draw a wave on it, then that wavelength will stretch. So the same idea is true for the universe, it's expanding. And as a consequence of these observations in 1929, Einstein was forced to abandon the idea of a static universe. The universe is expanding. And this is um, a simple-minded picture of that, where we have galaxies moving apart from one another. But I do think it's important to note that that doesn't mean everything is expanding away from everything else. I mean, certainly, I'm not expanding away from, from my laptop. And in fact, our entire galaxy, the Milky Way, is decoupled from the expansion. It doesn't, the gravity inside the Milky Way is so strong that we don't feel the expanding universe. And we have neighboring galaxies like the Andromeda galaxy that we are going to merge with eventually because the gravity is so strong. But on very large scales on the average, the universe is expanding. So cosmologists think of the universe as starting 14 billion years ago in a hot primordial soup of particles. And these particles included quarks and leptons and photons and lots of other things, where initially all these things were very tightly packed together, interacting with each other all the time. So it was a very hot, dense universe. And then as time goes on, the universe expands and cools off. So the particles start to move apart from one another and those interactions become more rare. This is a raisin bread model for the universe. Let's say you take a piece of raisin bread dough and you put it in an oven and then you observe that the dough rises. And no, I've never done this, maybe you have, but uh, when that happens, the raisins move apart from one another, not because they're moving on their own or anything like that, but simply because the raisin bread is expanding underneath them. So this is meant to be an analogy for galaxies, which are moving apart from one another simply because the universe is expanding. Now there's one major difference between the raisin bread and us, which is that the raisin bread does have a central point, but we think that our universe does not. So if I go back to this picture, instead of having us be at the center of this picture, let's go to some other galaxy. So wherever you are in the universe, you'd say this, see the same thing on the average. You'd see all the galaxies moving away from you. Now, I wanted to talk about some misconceptions people have about the Big Bang. They, they, seem, they think of it, um, the press shows it this way as well, that the universe started from a, a point. But that's not really the right way to look at it. So let's think about looking backwards in time as we go back in, in, into the early universe. And when we do that, then everything gets closer and closer together because in, backwards in time, the universe is contracting. So everything in this room would contract to a point but it's possible that the, uni the universe is infinite, in which case, sure, everything gets closer and closer together, more dense. But you know what? There's still stuff out at infinity, no matter how far back you go in time. But if you do that, eventually the density at each point is so great that our laws of physics as we know them no longer describe the universe. So our laws of physics fail, and we, we would have to have a theory of quantum mechanics together with gravity at the same time maybe something like string theory. But really, if you go to you go backwards in time enough, things are just too tightly packed and we don't know what to do. And so that's actually what the Big Bang is. It's that, it's that point in time and it happens at every point in the universe. So you can think of the Big Bang as a point in time, not a point in space. There's not really an explosion either, but let's put one everywhere in this infinite universe. So where do we stand in cosmology? 
Well, as I mentioned in the last hundred years, we've really had a quantitative field of cosmology, and, but it's, it, there's even more that's gone on since the turn of the millennium. We've answered some of the big questions about the universe. What is the geometry of the universe? What is the total mass and energy content? How old is the universe? So we have answers to these questions, but we have plenty of other questions remaining. And the one I'm addressing today in particular is what is the universe made of? Before I go into that subject, I wanted to talk to you about the geometry of the universe, because in the 1930s, there were three possible geometries. So these are pictures of, of lower dimensional analogs. So you can imagine that one possibility is that the universe is in the shape of a sphere where everything would be on the surface of that sphere. And another possible geometry would be a saddle shape or a hyperboloid universe. And again, it's, this is not, it would be a higher dimensional one that I'm obviously I'm not able to plot or a flat geometry. Now, when I say flat geometry, I don't mean two dimensional. I just mean there's no fancy mathematics, no curvature. The ordinary stuff, like the fact that the angles and triangles add up to 180 degrees. So ordinary geometry holds. Whereas for these others here, the angles and the triangles would be less than 180 when you add them together, or on the surface of the sphere would add up to more than 180. So it's a, so these two just have a strange geometry, a strange curvature. Um, another way to, to picture this is if there's this little creature sending off two light beams in parallel directions, what, what we've been taught that we consider ordinary is that two parallel light beams never meet. But it turns out if you're living on the surface of a sphere, that might not be true. In fact, these light beams would converge eventually and then and hit this, this creature from behind. Or on the surface of a saddle, the two light beams would diverge. And this is exactly what was used, this trick to, to tell, looking for how light beams move that enabled us to learn what the geometry of the universe is. So the, the way to do it is to use the cosmic microwave background, which is the leftover light from the big, from the hot early epoch of the universe. And so this, this is, it's like if you take the earth and you squash it down and you end up with a shape like this. And so they're in this leftover light, it's almost all at the same temperature, but some spots are a little bit hotter than others. And so the, the orange spots are slightly hotter by one part in 10 to the five than the average, and the blue spots are slightly colder. So when we look at this, if light was moving in parallel lines between the time of creation of this cosmic microwave background, between then and us, if the light was moving in straight lines, we know that the size of the hot spots should be about one angular degree in scale. In other words, if we look in one direction or one angular degree apart, then you'd have a lot of power on that length scale. So going back to the previous picture, if light moves in straight lines, you expect a lot of action on one degree angular scales. And sure enough, that's what this, this is data from the Planck Space Telescope. What that sees is look at this one degree angular scale and whoop, it's called the Doppler peak. And that means that light is, is moving in straight lines in the ordinary way. And that tells us that the geometry of the universe is flat. And this is enormous, enormous progress in, in figuring this out. And I just wanted to say there are seven peaks in here. And from the other seven peaks, you learn an awful lot more about the universe. But I do have to say again, that the flat geometry does not mean the universe is two dimensional. In fact, let's think of it as a cube and you take each direction out here to infinity. So it's, it could be an infinite universe. It's just that the geometry is ordinary. And that's what we mean by flat versus curved geometry. So I'm gonna show one equation. There's not a lot of equations in this talk, but um, I wanna relate. This is Einstein's equation of general relativity. And on the left-hand side, you've got the curvature of space. The geometry is on the left-hand side. And what this equation does is relate it to the mass and energy content of the universe with some constants out front. So once we know the geometry of the universe, we also know the total energy density and the, and the answer is 10 to the minus 29 grams per cubic centimeter. So that's the number. If you go into outer space, that's what the universe looks like in terms of content. And that's very different from water on earth, which is one gram per cubic centimeter. So this is very diffuse stuff. And I did try to explain uh, um, space to the Queen of Sweden. It was a fiasco, the whole story. And if you're interested, ask me later.
before I um, before I continue, I do have to tell this joke. So this is the same data, but with from a different satellite with some different um, colors chosen just for the picture. And look, Stephen Hawking initials in the data. Um, so Denjo, you're not muted, so we can hear you every now and then. Oh, oh, thank you. Sorry, I. I oh, no, no, I'm fine. I just thought I'd let you know. I meant to mute myself. So now I'm gonna to turn to this question of what the universe is made of. And it starts out by just being surprising right from the get-go. So if we take everything that we know from our daily, daily experience, your body, the air you breathe, the chair you're sitting in, the walls of the room, the earth, the sun, all the planets, everything that we know about, it's all made of atoms. But the weird thing is that, it, that all of that adds up to only 5% of the universe, which means 95% is dark. Yep, here we go. So this is the uh, and the whole universe. The five percent is is ordinary stuff, and including the, the, the including stars and everything that gives off light. And the rest, we have twenty five percent dark matter and seventy percent dark energy. And these numbers come from those other peaks in that cosmic microwave background. So this is a pretty bizarre situation. So most of the universe is made of stuff that we can't we have not yet identified. It is the dark side of the universe. So this dark matter problem is now 90 years old. It dates back to Knut, Knut Lundmark, and a Swedish man in 1930, and Fritz Zwicky, a Swiss scientist working with the same telescopes that Edwin Hubble had in California. And in, and in what famously Fritz Zwicky looked at the coma cluster, which contains hundreds of galaxies. And he looked at the galaxies on the outer edges of the cluster, how they're moving around in a circle around the center of the galaxy. and based on how many internal galaxies there were, you should be able to calculate how fast those outer galaxies should move. But whoop, they're whizzing. They're going much faster than they should. And so the conclusion that he came to is there's more mass inside there pulling on those outer galaxies. And he called that dunkle materie or dark matter, where the word dark simply means it's not stars, it doesn't shine. He was a quite, he is apparently quite a character. So in his book, he called his colleagues spherical bastards because they're bastards no matter what direction you look at them from. There was a lot of um, a lot of more observations that happened after that, but it really was the work of Vera Rubin in the 1970s who nailed it. So she showed that every galaxy contains dark matter in it, and that led to science consensus consensus that dark matter really is it's it's everywhere in the universe. And I'm gonna show you um, by analogy to, in order to explain what she did, let's back up and look at the solar system, which has nothing to do with dark matter, but let's look at a picture of the average speeds of the planets. So V stands for velocity. And so here, as you go up this way, you get faster and faster. And this is the location of the sun and R stands for radius. So as you move here, you get farther and farther away from the sun. So the first planet Mercury is the fastest. Then we have Venus, the second fastest, Earth, Mars, da 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 da. And, and I'm, I was supposed to remove Pluto because we don't think of it as a planet anymore, but I, instead I added a 10th planet. Whoops, I decided to leave it for fun. So here's the, I think this is the, the only other formula really in my, in my talk, which is that the, this velocity, the speeds of these planets is determined by their distance from the center and the mass of the sun. So when we've got a square root here, so if the mass of the sun were four times as big, all of these guys would be moving twice as fast. But you notice that as you move out, the velocity gets slower and slower. So this shows the idea of dark matter, uh, sorry, the idea of um, rotation curves. And let me show some, this is Tycho Brahe. He was the one who made the measurements of these planetary orbits. He lost his nose in a duel and wore a gold and silver, silver replacement, I cannot imagine. There, was, there were stories that, he had, uh, that I'd always heard that he died at a dinner with the king because he drank too much wine, his bladder burst, and he died three days later. But then about 10, 15 years ago, there was an alternate theory that they decided to test, which is that his student, Johannes Kepler, with the famous Kepler's laws, that Kepler had poisoned him. And so what they did was dug up his body and they tested his mustache hairs for sign of mercury poisoning but there was none. So I guess it's true, the story that he, he died at a dinner with the king from a burst bladder. So I got, you know, I got to go to a Nobel Prize parties several times. And indeed, I was in my ball gown at, at the dinner 
um, I wasn't at the table with the king, but a neighboring table, and I went up to use the ladies' room, and I was chastised upon my return for not, if you're going to go to the bathroom, then at least go around the outside. So I totally believe this story, because you're not supposed to get up if the king is seated. So returning back to the question of dark matter now, I'm going to show the same kind of picture for galaxies, the same rotation curves that I showed for the planetary systems. So this time I'm starting with the center of the galaxy and moving a distance r away from the center. And then you can watch things move around the center and ask, okay, what is the speed of this star or dust or whatever gas that's moving around the center? And the speed that it's moving, that it's orbiting with is determined by the amount of mass interior to that radius. So again, if you have more mass in here, more dark matter, then these things move faster. And that's what Vera Rubin found. So this, again, this, this is the velocity of things around the center of the galaxy as, as a function of the radius away from the center of the galaxy. And if you, based on the stellar light that we see in the sky, the disk of the galaxy, this is what that you would expect, just like the solar system rotation curve. But instead, there's this flat rotation curve. There's really fast movements. And so we have to add an additional material in, in, a, uh, in order to explain these, these fast rotation curves. So a picture of that would, that we can see is the, our galaxy, the Milky Way, where at the center of our galaxy, there is, and it's shown in yellow just so you could see it, there's a very large black hole at the center of the galaxy. And I want to mention about that because it was, that's the 2020 Nobel Prize in Physics was given to Andrea Goetz and Reinhard Genzel for the discovery of this supermassive black hole at the center of our Milky Way. And that thing weighs about 4 million times as much as the sun. And they discovered it, but you watch things, you can't see the black hole, but you can watch things moving around it and then infer the presence of the gravitational thing that must be in there pulling on everything. So I do want to say supermassive black holes are not the dark matter. Every galaxy has one at the center, but they only make up a tiny fraction, like a millionth of the universe. So no, black holes are, the, these guys are not the, the dark matter. Okay, so we have the black hole at the center, and then we have these spiral arms of structure where all the stars are, and our sun is along one of these spiral arms. But then we take all of this structure of the Milky Way and we turn it on its side, and then you get here, that's the disk of the galaxy. And here's the center, and then we go out 25,000 light years, we get to the sun. But all of this is just a tiny piece of the mass of the galaxy, which this is an artist's rendition, looks something like this. So there's the disk of the galaxy with the spiral arms, but then there's this giant spherical thing that we call a halo made almost entirely of dark matter. So I talked about rotation curves as the first way that dark matter was discovered, but since then there are many, many pieces of, of, of like a puzzle with all the pieces fitting together. So the second way that, we, that people tested for dark matter is using Einstein's gravitational lensing. So here the idea is that mass bends light. So if I draw, put some dark matter in here, this is a massive compact halo object, but whatever it is, you put where, wherever there's some dark matter, the dark matter doesn't give off light, but what it does is bend the light that is behind it. So here's a star and the light gets bent on the way to the telescope by the mass that's in between. The mass pulls on the light. And, and then, so then when you look with your telescope, you'd think, okay, there's a star over here, wait a minute. It's a very sheared looking star and wait a minute, there's another image over there. So you'd see multiple images and possibly even an entire ring of images. Um, and then from look, studying the, these things, these sheared multiple images, you could extrapolate backwards and figure out what is the dark matter that's in between. So that's a way of finding the dark matter. Now on your phone, there's an app for gravitational lensing that is, was um, a graduate student at Michigan University of Michigan created, and it has the correct equations of gravitational lensing, so you can lens yourself more and more and more. Now here's some actual data of lensing that's um, taken by Hubble Space Telescope. So there's many pieces of lensing going on in here of, of background light, bright galaxies that are lensed by things in, on, on route, and so you see these sheared multiple images. And by studying that background light, you can learn about the dark matter in between, and you can use a computer to reconstruct the dark matter in between. This is not the same object, but it's also data from Hubble Space Telescope, and I'm showing the matter that's in between. So here you have 
these galaxies, this is a cluster of galaxies with many galaxies sticking up, but then there's additional dark matter in between. So this is the reconstruction of the mass uh, using a computer from the light that we see. Now, a third piece of evidence for, for dark matter is the famous bullet cluster. So here we have two clusters of galaxies that collided with each other. And when they did that, the two types of matter behave very differently. So if you and I collide, we're not getting very far. We're getting stuck because we have electromagnetic interactions. We have strong interactions that hold our nuclei together. And that's what happened with the gas. And it's shown in pink. And what it's actually doing is giving off x-rays. So we know that's how we know where it is. So the gas gets stuck. But then again, using gravitational lensing, we see something else shown in blue. And that's the dark matter, which behaves very differently because it doesn't get stuck. It just keeps going. It doesn't have electromagnetic interactions. It doesn't have it, uh, strong interactions. So it behaves differently from ordinary matter. Another amazing thing to think about is that without dark matter, we wouldn't exist. And the reason for that is ordinary matter is interacts all the time with photons because it gives off light, it, it interacts with light. And so the light moves out really fast if you try to clump it and it pulls the ordinary matter along with it. But dark matter doesn't interact with, with photons and so it can clump. So if you have a little bit of extra dark matter in some regions, so this would be to start with, you, the dark matter is almost uniformly spread out. And by the way, the dark matter is what you see in blue here. Um, so it's almost uniformly spread out, but there's some regions that have a little more mass and they're gonna end up pulling in more and more and more. So let's watch this computer simulation as time goes on and watch these dark matter particles clump more and more and more and more. So this is today. Uh, and you see these long filaments of structure of dark matter, and the galaxies would be at the intersections or nodes of these filaments of structure. So again, none of this could have happened. You have to make the dark matter clump first, and then the ordinary stuff um, falls in along with the dark matter later. So that's what enables the formation of galaxies, which is what we need in order to exist. So I've shown you some of the, the many pieces of evidence for dark matter, and the, one of the most powerful, in fact, is this cosmic microwave background where the Doppler peak gave us the geometry of the universe. And these other peaks uh, give us information about the fact that dark matter has to be there. So in terms of the pie chart of the universe, this is what we get. And this 25% of that's dark matter, we'd like to understand what it is. And this is a puzzle that's been around for a long time now. And we know from people, the first things to try, gas or dust or snowballs and things like that. But they would have observational consequences that we don't see. So that was ruled out right away. And in fact, what we're driven to is um, exotica, things that we, we propose new things and they haven't been discovered yet. Neutrinos would have been great because we do know they exist. They're part of the standard model of particle physics, but it turns out they're too light. And so they would ruin, ruin galaxy formation just the way that the, the particles of light do. They stream out. They don't allow things to clump together uh, rapidly enough. There is another type of neutrino that not, not the standard one, but a, a, a fourth kind of non-standard neutrino, sterile neutrino, that's a possibility, or primordial black holes. A lot of attention given to that lately because the gravitational waves that were discovered could be due to primordial black holes. So a lot of interesting ideas, but um, I'm gonna focus on, on the, the ones that have the strongest theoretical motivation, and those are the WIMPs and the axions. So um, the best motivated ones, as I said, are these two, because we don't, cosmologists don't need to invent new particles. These things already exist for other reasons in particle theories. Uh, so I don't have, I'm not going to talk a lot about axions. I just want to mention that they're light particles and there's a problem in the theory of the, of the strong interactions that hold your nuclei together. And as part of the solution to that problem, you automatically get these, these light but non-relativistic relativist, particles called axions. And there's a lot of experimental action going on with people looking for these things. What I want to focus on instead is the WIMPs weakly interacting massive particles. This is the topic I've worked on primarily. And a reporter asked me, okay, how many hit you of these things? And so I, we figured it out. Billions pass through your body every second if they exist. And roughly one a day to one a month 
hits one of your nuclei. But it's ex completely harmless because, as we've been saying, no strong forces, no electromagnetic forces. Yes, they feel gravity. Um, and that oh, there are four fundamental forces of nature. And so the one that's remaining after these three is the weak force, which is responsible for some types of radioactivity. So the idea is that we imagine the dark matter is made of a new fundamental particle not yet identified, and it has these weak interactions. And when we say massive, we mean it weighs one to 10,000 times as much as a proton. So the two reasons that these WIMPs are considered to be such good candidates is that first, they, you automatically get the right abundance in the universe today. So a lot of these, in their, their, if they are their own antimatter, that means that whenever they hit, they annihilate with each other and turn into something else. And so in the early universe, you can compute how many of these things there are. You can compute how much inter annihilation is going on. And then eventually when the universe is too spread out, that annihilation stops and we know how many are left. And if you do that, then you get the right abundance today where the only ingredient in this calculation is the weak force. So you, if you, with the weak force, you right, get the right abundance today. The second reason that WIMPs are, have good theoretical motivation is they're already there in particle theories, especially supersymmetry, an important extension of the standard model of particle physics. Here, every particle we know has a partner. In the standard particles, each of them gets a partner. And the heavier ones decay to lighter, 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 until you get to the lightest supersymmetric particle. That one's stable, and that may be the dark matter. So we have this theoretically well-motivated particle. And so now what we have to do is go and, and find it. So you can make it, you can shake it, you can break it, depending on which direction you're looking at this diagram. So here we have two dark matter particles. On the, that I've drawn on the left, and two ordinary particle matter particles on the right, interacting via the weak force. And it's all a question of um, what, what goes in and what comes out as, as far as how you read this diagram. And then the other way to look for this is to look for my, this is my baby dark stars. I hope I have a bit of a chance to tell you about that. So the first way is to try to make these particles, and that is using these particle accelerator at CERN in Geneva, where you, this is a 17 mile ring and it takes protons and brings them up to nearly the speed of light in opposing directions and then has them collide at detectors, CMS or Atlas detector in particular. That's where these two proton beams collide. And I've got to show some pictures. So this is Fabiella Gianotti. She was the spokesperson for the Higgs search and is now the overall director at CERN at the entire accelerator. In front, she's in front of the Atlas experiment, also shown here. And there's a guy standing there. This is such an unbelievable accomplishment of humanity to build these things. And Peter Higgs in front of the other, the CMS detector. So the one thing that has so far happened from this collider at CERN is the discovery of the Higgs boson at 125 times the mass of a proton. A proton weighs a GeV, so it's 125 times as heavy. And that was discovered in 2012. And at that point, the entire standard model of particle physics is complete. We found everything. And a second major goal of this detect of this collider is that you collide the two protons and you would produce supersymmetric particles. And in the end, the dark matter particle would escape detection. So you'd be finding the supersymmetry in the form and, and dark matter, but nothing's been seen yet, which means particle masses are being pushed to higher possibilities. So unfortunately, the LHC might may never be, it's a supersymmetry could be correct, and yet the LHC will never find it. So I hope that's not the case. I hope they discover it. The second way to search for WIMPs is in underground laboratories, taking advantage of the fact that you've got these billions going through your body every second. So put a detector there and watch the scattering of these WIMPs off the detector. And when that scattering happens, a little bit of energy is deposited in, inside a nucleus, and you can hope to detect that very, very small amount of energy and very slow count rates, very difficult experiments. So I like to tell about the story of how I got into cosmology and studies of, of dark matter. And that here's my PhD advisor. I was at the University of Chicago, David Schramm. He was a big guy. He was a, nearly went to the Olympics in wrestling. We called him Schrambo, and one of the founders of this field of astroparticle physics. And then I went as a postdoc to Harvard, where I worked with David Spurgle and Andre Druckier. And we were among the first to study the idea of 
um, WIMPs in the galaxy and how you might detect them. And we, we figured out what the count rates would be. And then people started building experiments. So there you go. You have to be deep underground, a mile underground. For example, in the Grand Sasso Tunnel uh, underneath the mountains outside of Rome. And so when we propose these ideas, and at this point, it's a worldwide effort. And so everywhere, there's all these experiments going on. And the one I want to talk about in particular is in that, in that same tunnel, the Dama Libra experiment. Out of all these experiments, this is the only one that has some hints of detection. And the way this works is that, well, the Earth goes around the sun. And as a consequence, we predicted that the count rate should go up and down with the time of year, maximum in June, minimum in December. So there's solid curve. That's our prediction as time goes on. And sure enough, their data exactly matches. So that, and they're, they're made of crystals of sodium iodide crystals, and they're definitely seeing this annual modulation, but it's not clear if what they're seeing is dark matter or not. They won't let us see their data. And the other thing is that other experiments are not seeing any signal. So, oh, this is just fun. Juan Colliar saying, these are leaders of three, three different experiments. I'm a Spaniard caught between two Italian women, the leaders of these three experiments. So, the, so the, the trouble is that if we want to ex compare this positive result from the DAMA experiment shown in green with the negative results of the other experiments, that means you're supposed to be below the red and green line. So does that mean you've ruled out the DAMA experiment? Well, no, because these experiments are made of different materials. So in order to put them on the same plot, I had to make some serious assumptions. So you don't want to do that. What you want to do is build more experiments of the same material as DAMA and that's happening. So we'll know within the next few years because two of the experiments, cosine 100 and INIES, already have data. And so just give us a few more years and we'll know if they're going to either confirm or rule out this um, signal. There's one other experiment that has um, an excess at low energy. So there's another possible signal there. So that's something completely different. But we, so there's, and you know, I'm running out of time. So I don't have time to tell you the ideas we have. For, well, I'll tell you about this one. Okay, new ideas for dark matter detectors. A nanometer thin plane of gold, that means one atom thick, okay? With strands of DNA hanging there. And yes, you can buy this from the Illumina company for a few hundred dollars, although we have to make much cleaner samples than this. And once the wind hit, wimp hits the gold, then a gold nucleus goes forward and breaks the DNA. And because we can control the DNA so beautifully, the A, C, G, the pairs or whatever, we construct it in advance that we are able to reconstruct this track of the gold, which means we know the direction the wimp came from. And that makes it hugely easier to identify, to know what's going on and really say, yeah, we've got some wimps. So I, I don't, I'm running out of time. I just um, wanted to mention this indirect detection I, where you're actually- I think you have 10 minutes. Just, oh, we started a little late, so. Oh, okay, great, thank you. So this is this indirect detection. The third way to look for these particles is that you're looking for the same dark matter annihilation signal that I was saying happens in the early universe that gives the right abundance of WIMPs. Well, that it doesn't happen in most places of the universe, but for example, at the center of our galaxy, there's a lot of more dark matter than average. So the annihilation would happen. And then at the end, that would lead to uh, a chain of particles in the end, giving you neutrinos, positrons, or high energy photons. And so there are experiments looking for all three of those. And of all of these, well, this is fun. At, at the South Pole, you've got the ice cube experiment with these two kilometer deep strands of, of photo tubes that are taking pictures, waiting for the neutrinos. Here's the Eiffel Tower for comparison. So they haven't found anything, but this guy, the Fermi satellite, well, it may have. So this is a satellite that looks at high energy particles of light, gamma rays, and it's in looking towards the galactic center. Well, here's, this is the gamma ray sky. And at the center of the galaxy, you see these giant double bubbles. And at the center, very center of the galaxy, there's an excess, okay? So the question is, you've got extra, extra photons coming from there that you don't know what the origin of them is. Could that be dark matter annihilation that gives rise to these photons? So that's an interesting idea, but it could also be pulsars. We don't know. It could be something else. That's the problem. But 
So there's, there are these hints, a number of different hints. We have the annual modulation hint from the DAMA experiment. We have this excess in the other experiment. And we have the Fermi looking towards the galactic, galactic center, seeing extra photons coming from there. And as a theorist, we are looking to try to explain all these different things. Are they compatible with each other? What is going on? So we have a, a, a lot to do. So this does lead me to, I'm glad I have a minute to talk about dark stars. And this is an idea where we use that same dark matter annihilation. I used it three times now. I used it in the early universe. I use it for the indirect detection. And this time I'm using it to power stars. So this is work, an idea that we, I had with Douglas Spoliar and Paolo Gondolo. And we called them dark stars, but we didn't know about this movie that predated us. This is, apparently it's a cult film. So the idea here is that the very first stars to form in the history of the universe, they would have formed when the universe was about 200 million years old. Remember, we're now at 14 billion. So that was early on. And these very first stars to form could be powered by dark matter annihilation and they wouldn't ha would have no fusion at all. So it's a different power source, but I have to emphasize right away that these dark stars are made entirely of hydrogen and helium. Well, almost entirely. And the dark matter only constitutes less than 0.1% of the mass of the star. So it's ordinary matter that's powered by dark matter. The way it works is you have in the in you have these proto galaxies and smack at the middle there's a lot of dark matter so you have and then a, a cloud of hydrogen starts to collapse en route to making a star but the dark matter as it as it, right where the dark matter is there's a lot of dark matter annihilation going on and those dark matter annihilation products they get stuck inside this collapsing molecular hydrogen cloud and they thermalize with it they heat it up and so they stop this cloud from collapsing and they give rise to a really weird star. Dark stars in radius are 10 times the distance between the Earth and the Sun. They're very puffy, cool, giant objects with dark matter annihilation throughout. And because they're so cool, they can grow. They start out with about the mass of the Sun, but then they can accrete more and more and more material. And they can get up to 10 million times the mass of the Sun, 10 billion times as bright. In that case, that means they will be detectable in the upcoming James Webb Space Telescope, which should launch later this year. At least I hope so. Soon, anyway. Um, and the other nice thing about these objects, these supermassive dark stars, is that when they die, they will collapse to black holes of a million solar masses. And they could easily become the seeds for the supermassive black holes that I talked about earlier towards the beginning of the talk. And there are supermassive black holes, not only at the centers of galaxies today, but even very, very early in the universe. It's called the big black hole problem. How can you explain making giant black holes early on? So you need some kind of phenomenon similar to what I'm describing to make those black holes. So there's good chance of detection this decade using one of these techniques, the underground experiments, the indirect detection of the annihilation products, collider searches, shooting those protons together at very high energies or looking for dark stars. So in my last few minutes, I want to just say a few words about this big beast, the dark energy that's 70% of the universe. And um, to, to I'll, I'll start out by saying that all the stuff that we call matter, whether it be ordinary matter or dark matter, the definition of matter is that it feels gravitational attraction. Um, so that is very different from the dark energy, which has some kind of repulsive force. It's pushing things apart from one another. In fact, it's making the universe accelerate. So going back to this picture of galaxies moving apart from one another, the weird thing is fairly recently in the history of the universe, suddenly they started accelerating away from one another. It's a very weird situation. And so what kind of progress are we going to make on this? I mean, on the theoretical side, we've tried vacuum energy, cosmological constant, putting that in, back into Einstein's equations, or do we need to modify Einstein's equations? The theory is, is very difficult, very hard to understand what's going on. I've tried some alterations to Einstein's equations too. And then, but on the, on the observational side, we, what we are gonna learn is 
if it is a vacuum energy, was it always the same value of the vacuum energy or did it change in time? So there are going to be ex um, telescopes going up that are going to help answer at least some of the questions on the observational side. So I'm going to end with a joke. I was on a panel in New York at the World Science Festival, and the three of us on the right here were talking about dark matter. And these three guys were talking about dark energy. And so I made the one statement that is true. The only thing that we do know about the difference between dark matter and dark energy. So I said that at the end of that panel. And I'm going to stop here with showing this slide of this is my book that, that, that Danjo kindly mentioned at the beginning, the cosmic cocktail, three parts dark matter with the cosmic cocktail recipe. If I have a 10 ounce drink, I need 2.5 ounces, which are rounded to three of dark matter, seven of dark energy, and then this other stuff, including, uh, as I said, a millionth of an ounce supermassive black hole, it's a very small piece. And all of that shaken together in the hot early universe. And so that's, there you go, the cosmic cocktail recipe, and, and we're trying to understand what it's made of. Thank you, Catherine, for a really fascinating talk. That has been fantastic. Uh, there are a lot of questions at this point. Uh, maybe I'll go through them one at a time. Um, I think you've probably answered this one already. It's from uh, Vanita Agnihotri. Uh, what is a new discovery about dark matter? What is the new discovery? Well, I yeah. talked about a lot of the from the in the underground experiments, I talked about this the, the Dama experiment, and then the uh, so I talked about these hints of dark matter of different types. So, and then I'm hoping that we're going to have a new discovery when the James Webb Space Telescope launches. I'm hoping they're going to discover dark stars, but we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, and from Terry Gargan, I'm I'm mispronouncing all of these names, so please forgive me for these things. I just making wild guesses as to the pronunciation. Will, uh, will the universe continue to expand or could it retract like an elastic band and result in another big bang? Okay, that's a great question. So, for, so first of all, had the geometry been spherical, a sphere by definition would reach maximum expansion and recollapse, but it's not. The universe geometry is flat. And because it's accelerating right now, it looks like we're just going to keep accelerating, 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 and end up with the big chill with everything farther and farther apart and darker and darker. It's a really perfect Halloween ending. Now, but you know, we don't know. Is there something else that could possibly kick in? If Einstein's equations are different or something, and that it causes it causing it to recollapse. I actually have a model that's called the phantom bounce, <laughs> where it does that. It goes like this: it's larger and then smaller and larger. So it's, it's the it, Either then, and uh, so in that case, when you recollapse, you reach a big crunch. So either is possible, but it looks at the moment like Big Chill is winning. Yes. Um, from Liam, uh, do you have the radius of the dark matter cloud of the Milky Way? He wants to know all some numbers here. Yeah, okay. Um, we're not positive, but so it's something like the part you can see Oh, you see, the trouble is I'm using units of parsecs. So now I'm going to have to convert that to something that you know. Ah! So typical galaxy sizes are about a megaparsec. OK, so that's 10 to the 6 parsec. And a parsec is, is a few light years. So about a million light years, maybe 100,000 to a million light years. I hope that helps. <laughs> yeah, I think that should help. And uh, the and we are eight light minutes from the sun. So just to give them an idea. Right, uh, exactly. Eight light minutes from the sun, and I'm talking about a, a, a million light years. So exactly. yes. That's pretty big. Um, yeah. And from uh, Martin McCormack, uh, does the density of dark matter change across the plane of the galaxy? Um, so, Yes, the dark matter is concentrated towards the center of the galaxy, and then it moves away with as, as a function of radius. So the, the farther away you are from the center of the galaxy, the, the amount of dark matter goes down. 
So we think it drops roughly, I don't know if there's, there's more detail than you want, we think it drops roughly as one over R when you're at the center, and then as you move farther out, eventually one over R cubed, where R is the distance from the center. So yes, definitely peak towards the center. And from Roger, if the light from a distant star is lens by dark matter, why don't mm -hmm. we see a ring of starlight? Yes, that's called the Einstein ring that happens. So if you have a very, wow, that's a smart question. So if you have a, per, if you're perfectly lined up, okay, so here's the telescope and then there's the dark matter and the, 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 the star behind it. If it's all in a perfectly straight line, you'd get a ring, absolutely. Discovered originally the first one discovered by Jackie Hewitt. She's a professor at MIT. However, if things aren't perfectly lined up, then you'll just get um, a couple of images. You get, you know, you get two images, you get four images, whatever. You get a different number of images, depending on because it's not perfectly lined up. Um, and from Vanita, um, are the quarks anti quark antiparticles are the newest God particle Higgs found in dark matter or dark energy. Is... So all of those particles that you're talking about, the quarks and the Higgs boson, which yeah, I don't know what they call it, the God, God particle. Um, all of those are the standard model of particle physics. And nope, none of those can be the dark matter. So the dark matter is something else. So something new, fundamentally different. Yeah, that's just the trouble. Wouldn't it be nice? But we, we, if you add up all the ordinary stuff, it's only 5% of the total. So it's, no, it's not enough to make give you the dark matter. Nope. Yes, and it includes all of those particles. Oh, um, the standard stuff includes all of those particles, the Higgs exactly. and the quarks, and, yep. And there is no name yet for the, uh, for the dark ones. The, uh, no. the Katie Catherine Freeze particle. No, <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, from Maurice Skelly, how long are star are dark stars around before they collapse into black holes? Well, that's another a detailed good, question. That's some, these are some good questions. So this is another one we don't know. But the basic idea, as long as you have dark matter, as long as there's dark matter around, then there's dark matter power. Then this thing will continue to exist. It'll be big and puffy and keep growing. But so the, and so the, let's say you had one in a proto galaxy and then that proto galaxy merges with other proto galaxies. So then the question is, does the dark star move to the center of this next big thing that you start a proto galaxy weighs a million times as much as the sun. And then it merges to make something that is 10 million times as big as the sun. These are the, the, the halos of dark matter. Okay. The proto galaxies and they get bigger and bigger. So as long as the dark star remains in the center of this of these merging objects, there will still be more dark matter. And so it can fuel it and keep growing. So what we have to do is a cosmological simulation of where the dark matter is to answer this question, um, to try to, because so I don't really know. But the answer is going to be millions of years to billions of years, depending on the details of how these proto galaxies merge together. Once the dark matter power, once it, once this dark star moves to where there's not a lot of dark matter, the power has gone and then there's nothing to sustain it. It'll start to collapse. The gravity will start to win because there's no heat source anymore. And uh, just a back, somebody wants to know if uh, it's Al Bingham. He wants to know when you say the expansion started to accelerate, do we know when it started? To yeah, we do. This is it's at around a redshift of one. And I suppose you'd like to know that in years. And I don't know. Oh, heck. Then Joe, do you know? <laughs> um, I would. Yeah. It's a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> well, Red Shift of One is. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be able to do it. A billion years like ago, it. maybe? I'm going to guess a billion years ago. That's a reasonable guess. Yeah. Oh, it must be more because the sun is already. A red Shift to One is large, is a large Red Shift. Must be more than five billion years ago. So, yeah, sorry. I, we, we work in units that are not helpful in this case. <laughs> So more than um, 5 billion years ago, though. Yes, uh, from Edward, uh, do you think that improvements in gravitational wave astronomy may help in investigating dark matter? Yes. You know, I'm tempted to go back and show my primordial black hole sh slides. Shall I do it? Do it, go for it. Yeah, okay, let's see. 
So um, how do I go backward quickly? All right, I just, yep, it's kind of working. It's a quick review of the talk. Okay, hold on a second. So I, I have slides. So I think you can see, can you see this? Uh, not at the moment, no, you need to, it flashed off. Oh, so it somehow disappeared, huh? Yeah, you need to share again. Uh-huh, okay. Right, Maybe All right we so, have it now. Okay, I, um, so primordial black holes are black holes that would have been formed very, very early in the history of the universe, when the universe was only a few fractions of a second old. And the way it works is that you have some region that becomes super dense for whatever region, reason, and then that region sort of pinches off into a black hole. And Hawking is famously associated with this idea of primordial black holes. He wasn't the first, but he's famously associated with it. And so, for example, one possibility is that Early on, there were free quarks in the universe, but then at some point they became bound together in protons and so on. And when, while that happened, the pressure drop led to black holes. So at that particular transition would be an example of where you'd end up with primordial black holes. And the reason people got excited recently is because the LIGO detector in 2016, for the first time ever, discovered gravitational waves. And that we know they're due to merging black holes that weigh 30 times the mass of the sun. OK, and so that could be from these very early primordial black holes. If that's true, by the way, there will be millions of these between us and the center of the Milky Way, which would be really a fun thought. Um, so I think I'm going to lose you again because I have to end the show. No, I didn't lose you. OK, just to show you this LIGO experiment. And so the uh, basic idea of this experiment is you have four kilometer arms. And as a gravitational wave goes by, one of these arms gets a, a longer by a fraction of the size of a proton. And the other arm gets shorter because this, that's how these waves work. And so that, believe it or not, that was actually discovered in 2016. And they also know what it's from. It's merging of two black holes that weigh 30 solar masses, and those could be primordial black holes. And that's what gets people excited. So here's these, these merging black holes give off these gravitational waves, and they make the space time shift in such a way to stretch one arm and shrink the other. So that's, so I, I can't remember exactly what the question was, but that's so the, uh, these, so that's one way that LIGO is going to, these, um, gravitational wave detectors will help understand the black yeah. holes in the universe. Yeah, that was the question. If, they, if, if gravitational waves would help to understand dark matter. Um, maybe I, I, I can ask you just a quick question. Sure. Uh, on the time, on time scales again, when do you think we will have the um, conclusive evidence for what dark matter is made of. Said, I mean, if, you know, people- What's have your best guess? Oh, well, I think people ask that problem for the last 90, question for the last 90 years. But um, so this DAMA experiment, that will be resolved within five years. And so I, I hope it's not borderline. <laughs> I think it should be either proved or ruled out within five years. So that's, that'll be useful to answer that question. Yes. And the xenon excess, I have the impression that one will be ruled out because I'm getting hints from the, there's a competing experiment called Lux Xenon, and I'm getting hints from them that they're, they know what it is and it's not dark matter. So that one's getting ruled out. So yeah, well, so we'll know of answers on these two pretty soon. Okay, so I can't answer that. How, how soon will we know what the answer is? I don't sterile, know, neutrinos, sterile neutrinos, there's some potential detection there too. So um, I don't know, and I, I can't answer that. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, it's it's a throwaway question. It's just, I know. just I have no idea. Uh, you're optimistic. Yes, it would be nice to see some, uh, uh, for us theorists, it would be nice to see uh, some solid evidence pointing towards what is quantum gravity. Many of us are interested in quantum gravity and uh, hints from experiments telling us what most of the universe and the matter of the universe is made of would be rather nice. Oh, yeah. What a, what a, what a, what a crazy situation that we don't know. Yes. And we're really eager. So we're, you know, we're excited to maybe we're going to find out this answer soon. So, yes. Um, well, that's well, thank you so much for uh, agreeing to give this lecture. It's been fascinating. And uh, 
Uh, I think everyone has learned a, a lot about what is known, time scales so from the early universe onwards. So thank you very much, Catherine. That was that was fantastic. Well, thanks for the force. Thank you so much for including me in this festival. This is really fun. And happy Halloween. <laughs>